Jesus is our living hope has been our summer theme. It comes from the very first few, few verses in the book of 1 Peter, where it says, Jesus is our living hope. And you know, uh, the last two weeks, uh, we've covered the concept of the book that Jesus is our living hope when good people suffer. And then the last week, we talked about Jesus is our hope when the battle is at your door. And so that seems to always be so removed. And today we're going to talk about Jesus is your living hope when you are called to suffer. It's quite something when somebody else is called to suffer, but when you are called to suffer. Jesus put it this way, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Taking up your cross is literally going on a death march. When Jesus took up the cross, he was going to Golgotha, the hill of the skull, or also called Calvary, to be nailed to the cross there and to suffer and die for our sins. And what he's saying is, at this point in his ministry, that's where I'm going, and I want you to do the same. Wow. You don't hear too many people evangelizing people by saying, come on, go with me to die. You don't. Oh, God's got a wonderful plan for your life. <laughs> is that, is that the, 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 the approach? Um, that is only half the story. Sometimes I think we should tell the whole story. Because Jesus added to that, for whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me will find it. If all you care about is this life and you have nothing to do with the eternal, you're going to lose this life and you're going to lose your soul. But if you care about the eternal and you live your life for Jesus by dying for Jesus, if the Bible says, if any man is Christ, he's a new creature, the old is gone, the new has come. And for, to me, to die is even better, but, but he says that I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. There's a sense in which when I accept Jesus Christ as my Savior, I accept Him as my Lord, I'm saying, I died to myself. I now live for you, Jesus. Wow. Wow. Watch what Jesus says. What good will it be for a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? What can you give in exchange for your soul? Nothing. 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 So I got a question for you. When it comes to this thing, suffering, how do our sufferings here in the United States compare to the third world church suffering? Now, I can remember as a child, my dad had something to uh, <clears throat> inflict a little suffering on me. Some of you are laughing because you identify immediately. You know what that is. It is the paddle. Now, there was my dad's paddle, and then there was grandma's paddle. <laughs> You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah. Now, which one would you rather get hit with? You're going to say grandma's paddle every single time. And I think, I'm I'm making light of it, but there's a contrast here between our suffering in America and the suffering in the third world. For example, in the third world, suffering can lead to your execution. And we've seen this in the news Well, our suffering is we complain about, you know, at church the temperature wasn't cold enough. I was roasting. I was sweating. I had to get out my own personal fan. I mean, I was suffering for Jesus. Or in the wintertime, man, it's so cold. Can't somebody pay the the, the electric bill, the gas bill, so we can have some heat in the church? I mean, we are so suffering for Jesus. Oh. Some people, they suffer because, oh, I just don't like those modern songs. I think I'm just not going to go to church because they don't sing the songs I like. I have to suffer through those 7-Eleven songs. You know what I'm talking about? Seven words they sing 11 times. And then there's the other saying, what's with all those old hymns? Those are dead people songs. The, the people that wrote those aren't even alive. They died. Why do we have to sing the Jurassic songs? 
and I have to put up with that. I am suffering for Jesus. Are you getting the picture here? Our suffering, our suffering is nothing. The Voice of the Martyrs has a map on their website and it shows all the nations. See the real dark ones, the dark ones? Those are nations that restrict your faith. You cannot believe in Jesus. If you do and it's made known, you will be persecuted. Persecuted. Because you know Jesus. The ones that are just a little in, the, in between, you know, the, the colors in between. Those are the, where, the nations where the government doesn't necessarily do it, but the people there do it. They persecute Christians. Christians all around the world. There's a book, and I brought it up with me. I don't normally read out of books. But several years ago, Jim Coram and I and our wives, we were in Atlanta, Georgia, and we went to the First Baptist Church of Atlanta, and Charles Stanley, you know that name, he was preaching. We sat about five rows back. We were on vacation. We always go to church while we're on vacation. It's still the Lord's Day, right? Even when you're on vacation, it's the Lord's Day. So we're sitting about five rows back, and after the service, I said, man, I'm going to go to the bookstore, and I'm going to buy a book. And uh, I know he won't be here to sign it because he's already left, but I'm going to get a book that I said I got when I was there. And I went through the bookstore, and every time I went by, this orange book just jumped out at me. You ever have those experiences? A book just jumps out at you, and, and so I looked at it, and I went and I looked at some of Charles Stanley's books, and none of them were really grabbing me. I came back. I'll bet I went back five times and looked at this book. When, when that happens, you've got to buy it, right? You've got to buy it. So I bought it, and I started reading it immediately when we got in the car, and I got hooked on page four. And I'm going to read page four and five. I don't, you know, I never read. First of all, I'm a terrible reader. And then my glasses don't help. I still don't have my new glasses to fix my, my reading. But imagine all the blinds closed on a window of a dimly lit room. Twenty leaders from different churches in the area sat in a circle on the floor with their Bibles open. Some of them had sweat on their foreheads after walking for miles to get there. Others were dirty from the dust in the village from which they had set out on bikes <clears throat> excuse me, early that morning. They had gathered in secret. They had intentionally come to this place at different times throughout the morning so as not to draw attention to the meeting that was occurring. They lived in a country in Asia where it is illegal for them to gather like this. If caught, they could lose their land, their jobs, their family, or their lives. I listened as they began sharing stories of what God was doing in their churches. One man sat in the corner. He had a strong frame and he served as the head of security, so to speak. Whenever a knock was heard at the door, a noise was made outside the window. Everyone in the room would freeze in tension as this brother would go to make sure everything was okay. As he spoke, his, <clears throat> as he spoke though, his appearance soon revealed a tender heart. Some of the people in my church have been pulled away by a cult, he said. This particular cult is known for kidnapping believers taking them to isolated locations and torturing them. Brothers and sisters having their tongues cut out of their mouths is not uncommon. As he shared about the dangers his church members were facing, tears welled up in his eyes. I am hurting, he said, and I need God's grace to lead my church through these attacks. The woman on the other side of the room spoke up next. Some of the members in my church were recently confronted by the government officials. She continued, they threatened their family saying that if they did not stop gathering to study the Bible, they were going to lose everything they had. She asked for prayer saying, I need to know how to lead my church to follow Christ even when it costs them everything. As I looked around the room, I saw that everyone was now in tears the struggles expressed by my brother and sister were not isolated. They all looked at one another and said, we need to pray. Immediately, they went on their knees, and with their faces on the ground, they began to cry out to God. 
Their prayers were marked less by grandiose theological language and more by heartfelt praise and pleading. Oh God, thank you for loving us. Oh God, we need you. Jesus, we give our lives to you for, and for you. Jesus, we trust in you. They audibly wept before God as one leader after another prayed. After an hour, the room drew to silence and they rose from the floor. They, <clears throat> he says, humbled by what I had just been a part of. I saw puddles of tears in a circle around the room. Boy, that caught me. That caught me. We have it so easy as Christians. Peter is writing his letter to the Christians because he knows what is about to take place. The early Christians, time of his writing, Nero has arisen into power. Nero is going to lead an all-out persecution on the Christians. And in spite of that, the church grows. I often ask myself, why does the church flourish in the face of persecution? Wow. Perhaps they have legitimate, real church growth in America, and not just uh, the sheep switching shepherds or the fish jumping from one pond to the next. We need an all-out persecution in America. Because what I think it does is it weeds those who are Convenience-oriented Christians. It's convenient to go. I mean, the temperature's right in the room. I do like at least one of the songs they sing. You know, it's convenient-oriented. But if we really had persecution, our numbers would wane, and it would be the true followers of Jesus Christ who have taken up their cross and are willing to do the death march to die for Jesus. When the world sees that, they say, there's someone willing to die for what they believe. What is it that they have that I don't have? I want what they've got. And the church flourishes. It never flourishes with hypocrisy. It always flourishes with genuine, genuineness, real, solid, Bible-believing, praying Christians. So Peter anticipates tough times. I know that in this passage especially. Because there's some terms here that he uses. Painful trials. Now, painful trials. He didn't just say trials. Often they talk about temptations, difficulties, problems, and trials. But he's got to say painful trials. He talks about suffering in verses 12 and 13. He talks about insults, being insulted. That's probably the worst persecution we experience right now. Somebody insults me for being a holy Joe, and I take that to heart. Oh, woe is me. Hit me with another noodle. <laughs> Suffer is used in verses 15, 16, and 19, also in 12 and 13. It's just loaded in this passage. He said, listen, it's coming. He talks about judgment. He talks about hardship. He talks about false accusations. Listen, this passage is written, and he, he's been leading us up to this point, I think, in the book. Everything he's been saying is, it's coming. It's coming. So I got a little warning sign here, okay? Christianity may be hazardous to your health. Nobody told me that when I was eight years old and I accepted Jesus as my Savior. But having learned that has not dissuaded me or turned me back. Jesus is still my hope when the times get tough. You see, Christianity is not for the faint heart. And people will say, boy, Christianity is only a crutch. <laughs> they haven't read First Peter. <laughs> yeah, it is a crutch. You know what? And I've been wounded by sin. I need the crutch. I need the Savior. But Christianity is not for the faint heart. Wow, that was a long, long introduction to get to what I want to talk to you about today, is what Peter says. So when you are called to suffer, first thing is, don't be surprised. Listen to what he says here. 
Dear friends, do not be surprised. Oh, psh, the jack in the box. <laughs> See that again. You know, you crank the little handle on the side for the grandchild or the kid. And as you're cranking it, you know, he's got a smile on the face. And all of a sudden, boop, psh, it pops out two responses. He either bursts out laughing or they burst out crying because you just scared the kid to death. <laughs> I think the same is true when persecutions and sufferings and trials come to the person who is not grounded in their faith. When that pops up in their life, they either embrace it and say, wow, God counts me worthy to suffer for him, or I'm out of here. This Christianity is not for me. God's not with me. I'm in a difficult time. They start blaming God. It's one or the other. Dear friends, do not be surprised as the painful trials you are going to suffer don't don't be surprised it's coming you know, don't think it's strange when this is happening to you listen apostle paul put it this way in fact everyone who wants to live a godly life in christ jesus will be persecuted he didn't say may be persecuted if you haven't been insulted, then you're probably not living the Christian life uh, well enough for somebody to insult you over it. Now, I, I get people from time to time think that, Pastor, you speak too much on politics. Well, when, I'm an expositor. I just go through the Bible. And if it's there, it's there. If it's not there, it's not there. And, and I, I, I don't skip over any verse. Every now and then people say, well, you know, can't you be a little bit more positive? Well, if the passage is positive, I'm positive. If the passage is negative, I'm negative. I'm just the messenger. The message is from God. Listen, persecution is coming. I know that because I've read my Bible. And if you've read the last book of the Bible, the Revelation, you know it is really coming after the rapture. And I'm glad I know Jesus because I'm not going to be here for the worst of it. Amen? Yeah, that's true. That's true. Listen. Rejoice in suffering is the next thing. When suffering comes, he says, rejoice. But rejoice that you participate in the sufferings of Christ. You've taken up your cross and you're following Jesus and you're suffering too. You know why he's saying that? I mean, we're going to get to some reasons here, but immediately, you know why he's saying that? Because after Jesus died and was buried, God rose him from the dead and he will never die again. And after I am done suffering with Jesus, I am going to die and I'm going to be resurrected and I'm never going to suffer again. Amen. Hallelujah. This is great stuff. He says, rejoice. You see, Peter did. Peter had been preaching and, and, and the Sanhedrin brought him in and at the text before the passage I'm about to put up says, they flogged him, not with a wet noodle. I don't know if he got the full 39 lashes or what he got, but they flogged Jesus and told uh, Peter and told him, stop preaching in the name of Jesus. And Peter went back to the disciples and he said, he went back rejoicing. There it is. He's rejoicing. He just got beaten. And he goes back and he's rejoicing that, that they had been, him and John had been counted worthy to suffer disgrace for the name. The name is Jesus. Thank you, God. <laughs> you look down upon me and said, of all the world, I'm the one that you've chosen to be worthy to actually be beaten for Jesus. Hallelujah, praise the Lord, amen. We don't necessarily do that, do we? Not just him, the Apostle Paul also. He had been thrown in, in, in jail, and the Philippian jailer was at Philippi. He was listening to them singing. It blew his mind. You see, he'd been thrown in jail because he'd done a miracle. He cast the demon out of a woman who was uh, telling the future and it lost the money for the manager. And so the manager had him drug in, into the jail and he was thrown into jail. And, and there at midnight, Paul and Silas, his companion, they were praying and singing hymns to God. This is key. When you're, when you're suffering, it's, you just need to pray and sing hymns to God. All right, we sing one hymn a week. I think praise songs qualify too. Whatever you know, you sing that song to God. You sing it, you sing it. 
And what happened? At midnight, there was this terrible earthquake that took place. All the doors were sprung open. Even, even their shackles were sprung open miraculously. God was sparing them. And they, they don't even leave. They're just like, wow, look what's happening. The Philippian jailer whips out his sword. He's about to kill himself because he knows it's life for life. He let a prisoner escape. It's his life. That was the Roman law. He's propped it up. He's ready to lunge himself on it. And Paul yells out, hey, don't do yourself any harm. We're all here. He runs in before him and says to him, what must I do to be saved? Where do you get the message of salvation? Well, they were singing the hymns and praising and pray, praying God. The hymns they were singing were from the Psalter and they were singing the songs and, and he knew the songs of salvation that they were singing. And this man came to the Lord because of an earthquake and a hymn sing. Isn't that amazing? You might have noticed in the bulletin we got a hymn sing coming. This is a little plug. A little plug. You might want to come. Might be an earthquake. God might do something really miraculous in there. Hey, listen. We, in his suffering, the Apostle Paul is rejoicing. He's rejoicing. He says, But even if I'm being poured out like a drink offering on a sacrifice, I am glad and I rejoice with all of you so that you should be glad and rejoice with me. He's writing to the Philippians later that knew this story. He's saying, Rejoice, rejoice. That's the key theme of the book of Philippians. He's incarcerated when he writes this in a Roman imprisonment. And he's writing back and he's saying, just rejoice, rejoice, rejoice. God is in control of everything. Why is he saying all of this? So that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. Peter is writing these words in his epistle. When you're suffering, he says, so that you may be overjoyed. That's rejoice. When, the, when his glory is revealed. Now, in Matthew 17, he's already referred to this passage once in, first in the first chapter of the book, was the transfiguration. And the verse before the transfiguration, Jesus said, you shall not uh, see me until you see me in, in the glory of, of the kingdom. And as soon as he talked about his glory in the kingdom, the next verse says, he was transfigured before him and saying, ah, I'm going to let you see what it's like in the kingdom. And they saw the glory of Jesus and also Elijah and Moses with him and, and old Peter, man, he opens up his mouth and says, shall we build three tents for you to honor you? And boy, then clouds move in, thunder from heaven. God says, whoa, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. You listen to him and uh, because you can't put Moses and Elijah on a par of equality with Jesus. Jesus is the Son of God. And Peter had a glimpse of what it's going to be like when he comes in glory. How marvelous. Next he says, When you've been called to suffer for the name of Jesus, count the blessings. Count the blessings. That's what he says. You are blessed. You are blessed. Not because you're insulted. Not because you suffer. Not because you are accused of being a murderer or a thief or a criminal or a meddler. Not because of that. You are blessed because it was for the name of Jesus Christ. You see, if you're suffering, okay, if you're suffering because you've done something wrong, and you're having a punishment inflicted upon you by the government, <laughs> there's no glory in that. <laughs> if you're suffering from bad health because you've smoked, or, and now you've got lung cancer and you're suffering, there, there's no glory in that. That's, you brought that on yourself. But when you suffer because you stand up for the name of Jesus, you are blessed. You are blessed. I'm not sure that happens to many people anymore because we are a people who don't want anything to do with pain. At the littlest sign of pain, I take an aspirin, a Tylenol, ibuprofen. I don't want any pain. Suffering is this evil, it's this bad. But when you suffer for the name of Jesus, you are blessed. For the Spirit and the glory of God rests upon you. Listen, Paul says, I consider that our present suffering 
are not worthy to be compared with the glory that will be revealed in us. I got to thinking about this. Imagine we lived in America at the time of the colonization. You know, Ben Franklin has tied a key on the end of a kite string and flew it and discovered that lightning is electricity. <laughs> Whoa, you know, electricity. It, it, there's this new stuff on the block called electricity. <laughs> All right? And, and, and imagine our, our founding fathers, you know, and, and setting up our government. And uh, then all of a sudden, they're, they're, they're frozen. <laughs> And then they're all brought out of the thaw and alive today. What a shock to see. There wasn't a thing that they could imagine that we are living in today. Cars zooming by. How, how is that possible? I mean, I had the fastest steed in, in Washington. And, and, and look at that thing. Man, wow. And, and you pull out a phone and, and, and you're talking to people and you got their picture on there. And they're looking like, what is going on here? They cannot conceive of what we are experiencing today. Now, fast forward to eternity, said there's not a thing in this world that you compare to the glory that we're going to experience in heaven. Isn't that great? You, your mind can't conceive of it. He says, our presence are not worthy to be compared to the glory. The glory that's coming is going to be inconceivable. Next, he says, don't be ashamed. Whenever, you know, you're suffering as a Christian, do not be ashamed. I remember back one of the years ago when the, the, the New Orleans Saints were called the New Orleans Aints because they were in such a terrible losing streak. Probably as bad as the Lions. <laughs> Maybe even worse. And the fans would show up with bags over their heads. And it would say the ain'ts on there. And sometimes uh, when suffering comes up for a Christian, you get ashamed that you're suffering for the name of Jesus. But he says, don't you dare do that. Take that bag off your head. <laughs> you stand up, you be proud. Praise, he says, but praise God that you bear that name Christian. The word Christian is only used three times in the New Testament. The very first time was at Antioch, and they were called uh, Christians first at Antioch. Who was? The disciples. What is a disciple? A disciple is a follower. What are they following? They've taken up their cross, they're on the death march, and they're following Jesus. They're followers. He said, you'd be proud to carry the cross of Jesus. You'd be proud to suffer as your nails or your hands are nailed to the cross and you're lifted up. You, you'd be proud to identify with Jesus. Don't be ashamed. The next thing says, notice the outcomes. It's time for judgment to begin with the family of God. Now the judgment here is only discipline because all of our judgment was taken on the cross. All of it. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Romans chapter 8 verse 1. I want to sidetrack just for a moment. Jesus told a parable. And he said, says Jesus then told many things in parables, saying, here it is, I'm just going to kind of read it. A farmer went out to sow his seed. And he said, as he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it. Then he says, and some fell on the rocky place where it did not have much soil, and it sprang up quickly, because the soil was shallow. And, it says, but when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no roots. He then says, other seed fell among uh, the thorns, which grew up and choked the plant, choked it right out. Still other seed fell on good soil where it produced a crop of 160 or 30 times what was sown. He doesn't tell them what it all means, and he tells a couple more parables, and then he meets with the disciples, and he tells them, they ask him, why are you speaking in parables? He says, I'm doing it to hide the truth from those who don't believe, but to share the truth to those who do believe. And it says, if you believe, you know what I'm talking about. If you don't, you don't understand it. And he says, I'm trying to hold it back because uh, there's going to be judgment for them hearing and not listening or not knowing. 
In any case, he then explains it. He says, when anyone hears the message about the kingdom but does not understand it, the evil will come and snatches away what was sown in the heart. So the, it's the message that is spoken. When I preach, I'm, I'm scattering the seed of God's word and it's falling on the soils of people. There are the path people. They're hard to the core. And when the Word of God hits them, it more or less bounces off of them. They don't understand it. They could have sat. That seed could be sown week after week after week, but it just hits them and bounces off. They just don't get it. This is the seed that was sown along the path. People that just don't get the Word when they hear it. Then there's the rocky people. The one who received the seed that fell on the rocky place. That is the man whose heart The Word, hears the Word, he hears the Word, and at once receives it with great joy. Oh, he he just responds enthusiastically. It's an emotional high, an emotional experience. But text goes on and says, but since he has no root, he lasts only a short time. When troubles or persecution comes because of the Word, he quickly falls away. The convenience-oriented Christian who wants his ears tickled. Tell me what I want to hear, not what I need to hear. Tell me what uh, pop psychology wrapped I'd rather have a motivational speaker for my pastor than one that's going to confront sin in my life. I want to feel good. You can pack stadiums with people. When you're a motivational speaker. But when you preach the word of God, he says, listen, pops up for a little while, man, they're so churchy and they got all the Christianese and then as soon as the trouble comes along, they're gone. Then there's the thorny people, the one who received the seed that fell among the thorns. It is the man who hears the word, but his worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke it out. The world chokes it out. He's got one foot in the world and one foot in Christianity, and the world wins. Because the world chokes it out, making it unfruitful. But then there's the good soil people. (laughs) But the one who receives the seed that fell on the good soil is the man who hears the word and understands it. Says, oh, I get it. I am a sinner. I need the grace of God. I need Jesus as my Savior. I'll call upon you. Yes, Lord, I'll, I'll make you Lord. I'll take up my cross. I will follow you. And it yields a hundredfold. It produces. This one produces a crop. It yields a hundredfold, sixtyfold, thirty times what has been sown. That life is radically changed, becomes a new creature in Christ. Notice the outcomes. It says, For it is time for judgment to begin with the family of God. Timothy said this For the time will come when men will no will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, they will suit their own desires. They will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. (laughs) Hmm. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths, but you keep your head, keep your head in all situations. Endure hardship, there it is. Suffering, troubles, problems. Do the work of the evangelist. Spread the good news. be, Be a witness to Jesus. Discharge the duties of the ministry. Ministry means serve. Serve God. Even when you are suffering. That's what Paul did in prison. That's what Peter did in prison. Listen. If it begins with us, Christians, what will the outcome be for those who do not obey the gospel of God? If we're disciplined, they are condemned. They are condemned. They are condemned. Then he quotes from the Proverbs. And if it's hard for the righteous to be saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? You know how hard it is for the righteous to be saved? God had to send his son, Jesus Christ, to become one of us, to share our nature, and then live the perfect life, go to the cross as a substitute to die for us so that we could have salvation that he offers. That's how hard it is. That's why you can't do anything to save yourself. 
You're not God who's come in the flesh to die on the cross to pay in full the price of the sin, the debt you owe. You need Jesus. You need Jesus. My final one here is be committed to God's will. So then, he says, to those who suffer according to God's will, you're doing God's will and you're suffering for doing that. You're sharing the good news. You're living a Christian life. You're praying. You're, you're doing good. You're loving your neighbor as yourself. You love the God with all your heart. He says, you're doing God's will. Those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. You say, yes, Lord. <laughs> yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. You just keep saying, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. You commit yourself to your creator. You know who the... David did that. He said, Jesus did that on the cross. Jesus quotes David and he says, into your hands I commit my spirit. I'm committing it to you, God. I'm committing it to you. Even when you suffer. All right, so this one I'm going to wrap up with. So when the going gets tough for a Christian, the tough aren't surprised. Oh, I should have seen this coming. <laughs> I should have seen this guy. Hey, they begin to rejoice. Oh, finally, God, you count me worthy to suffer for your name. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. <laughs> they count the blessings. Look at, out of this, somehow, you're going to touch somebody else's life through what you're doing in my life, in my suffering. Someone's going to see it, and they're going to believe. Yes, I count my blessings. I am not ashamed. I'm going to stand up proud for it. Listen, I'll note in the outcome, I'd rather suffer for Jesus than to lose my own soul for all eternity. Yeah, I'm going to recommit myself to you, Lord. It's tough as it is. Where else can I go? I'm going to you, Jesus. I'm going to you, Jesus. Powerful passage for when you suffer. Your hope, your hope is in the living, resurrected Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father in heaven. We're thankful, Lord, that we live in an age and a time and especially a place where persecution is not as flagrant as other places in the world. We pray for our brothers and sisters in those other countries, third world countries, where to confess the name of Jesus invokes persecution, confiscation of their goods, destruction of their homes, threats to their lives, and even martyrdom. Strengthen our brothers in Christ. Lord, forgive us for being so cushy in our faith, so convenient-oriented that we do not stand on the principles of the Bible and hear loyally to you no matter what the cost. May your Spirit prompt us to take up our cross daily and follow in the steps of Jesus. So as he suffered and bore the cross before the crown, we might bear the shame for his name and we get the eternal reward and the fame in heaven. Help us get our focus on eternity and not just the now. This I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.